Hello, everyone, and welcome to another STEM Leadership Cadre, Coaching Cadre Showcase event. We are so excited to bring you the showcase event of Verde Valley today because we're going to highlight the hidden gem that we don't want to be so hidden anymore that is called the Science Vortex in Verde Valley. And we are so excited to have Cal Manis hosting this, and he's going to introduce uh, his who the person behind the magic at Science Vortex. So Cal, take it away. Thanks, Corey. Hey, everybody. So this is Cal Manis. I'm with uh, Arizona Science Center. And we have been partnering for many years with Lori Altringer of the Science Vortex of the Verde Valley. We wanted to uh, introduce Lori and the Science Vortex and see some of the amazing things that are going on here in Cottonwood. So I'm going to switch my camera around and we're going to start from the outside. And this is Lori. So um, Lori's going to be our guide. And here are, just so that you know, I'm going to take a pan around. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, the Oakwood Cottonwood School District has uh, provided this space in collaboration. It's an, a very interesting collaboration we see occasionally within rural communities. And it works out, it's been working out for for Lori, right? Yeah. So. Do you want me to mm -hmm. tell about it? Um, so we are on the campus of the Cottonwood Oak Creek School District called the Cottonwood Educational Services. It used to be Cottonwood Elementary School. And um, in, I believe it was 2019 or 2018, they consolidated schools so that they would have a campus for special programs. So now the special pro programs on this campus include the Science Vortex, um, specialty preschools. Um, we have a um, private school for um, kids with disabilities. We have uh, a alternative high school now on campus called Birdie Tech. And we have a, a bunch of other programs. I teach algebra to advanced students. So there's a little something for everyone on this campus. And um, Science Vortex moved in and a lot of the campus was not very full. And now every single classroom is being used for something on this campus. Cool. So yeah. we're on the outside. Yeah. Would you give us a little bit about what you're doing outside here? Yes. So um, we got a grant for a revitalization project out here um we when we first started it doesn't look like much because it's winter but um when we first started there was one tree that looked like it was on the outs and now we have one two three four large um fruit trees and then um, we have vines that are growing in the back um this year we had kids grow their own pumpkins for halloween um, and then we just got this mulch delivered and we're putting down um, boxes underneath the mulch to try to kill off the grass so that we can um, start from scratch and make this a true food forest. So that is the intention. Um, we also have these new plants right here. Um, so it's gonna be fun to see this transform. Um, this is only a year in, and as you know, gardening projects take a lot, but um, it's cool because a lot of the programs here on campus are contributing. That's great. Yeah. So let's um, go down to the next mural and okay. then we're going to head so inside. Looking on the on the floor, um, these gears have been here almost since the start. We did this um, during summer camp with summer camp kids. Uh, so that was the first mural we had, but you're going to see several murals. Um, we added this big steam mural um, just this past year with kids from a neighboring school um, came over as an after school club and um, we have a fantastic muralist named Joan Burke in the Verde Valley who um, came over and partnered with Science Vortex to make this happen. So um, it shows that we really highlight the 21st century skills of collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and communication. That's what Science Vortex is all about. And again, the kids worked on this, so. And um, Joan Burke is working with Gardens for Humanity. So that is a nonprofit um, that is really involved with school gardens around the Verde Valley. This is so such a cool space right here. Two questions come to mind. Number one, the kids come out and do um, work outside 
because I'm really interested in those gears. Are they textured? Or are those just painted there? No, well, they're just painted on, but man, they're fun, especially for the little ones who come to Science Vortex. They use it as a hopscotch. So oh. um, the gears we don't do much with educationally, but we do with the this mural and um, even just having the kids come out here and learn the art of creating a mural was um, pretty phenomenal because we even had, um, because usually with mural projects, it takes way longer than you think it's going to take. Um, we ended up having um, Boy Scout troops come out. We had public parties. And so a lot of people from with different ages and different backgrounds came out to help with us. That's great. And that's and that uh, provides ownership and buy in for your students who are who are really working on that steam project. That's really cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Yep. And I hope that um, come this spring and future years that the um, that the mural really highlights the change of this plot of land right in front of the science vortex. It's going to be a huge before and after, we hope. And they get and they get to see the fruits of their labor. So that's the key. Uh, yes, I saw what you did there. Good job. Right. <laughs> so we're going to go inside. And what was this before, Lori? What was this space before um, it became Science Vortex? The old library to the elementary school. So um, when I checked it out, I approached the school district um, and I was put to um, somebody on my board when we very first formed said, hey, I think you would get along with a superintendent at COCSD. And um, so we scheduled a meeting and um, I came with the intention of saying, could I have your cafeteria <laughs> to open up a steam center? And uh, he said, oh, I can't do that. We have we already have programs that use that. But let me show you a space. And he walked me into an empty library. It kind of had pinkish walls. And before you knew it, about a few just a few weeks later, I started painting the walls black. And he goes, you're painting them black? <laughs> so here's the science vortex. So think of this as an elementary school library, right? It's kind of two, almost like four large classroom sizes. Mm -hmm. And you walk in and... You see my math clock. There's a math <laughs> clock. I'm also an algebra teacher. So I do work part-time for the district as well, which is... Um, really handy for just keeping our relationships strong. Like we have a very strong bridge between Science Vortex as a nonprofit and the school district. And wait, then, a minute. wait a minute, Cal, did I just hear that she wears more than one hat as a public school teacher? <laughs> Shocking, also as a nonprofit director, right? <laughs> right, right. Danelle, do you have something? No, no, I just can relate to the many hats. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so true. And <laughs> folks, just so you know, we're going to put the Science Vortex uh, website in the show notes. So in case you need that later, those of us who are here online, you can check it out now. But um, we'll have that in the in the show notes. So, so continue this awesome tour, Cal. Thank you. So as we come in, as you come in, you'll see there's a it, it's a nonprofit, right? So donor wall. Very nice donor wall that's that's movable. And the kids made all of the play rings. So, um, and then you're greeted by? This is Mr. Bones. Mr. Bones. Quintessential Science Center. And, right. <laughs> Prop. Who, who gets dressed up on the holidays. He does, yeah. He's about to get his SciTech uh, Festival. We're going into the Verde Valley SciTech Festival month of February, which we'll get to, but he's, he's going to have that t-shirt on soon. <laughs> and then always having, you know, being able to have some interesting technology. Here's a, this is a computer, actually, a vertical computer. Yes, and this and was so, um, received thanks to Rain. So uh, our first funding came from the Rural Activation and Innovation Network funds. That was the very first funding that we got. So without that, don't think Science Vortex would be here, in all honesty. And so that got the ball rolling. Got the vortex spinning. The vortex spinning. <laughs> um, We're having fun with the puns today. Good, oh, good work. Good work, Lori. Right. So, uh, let's go on. yeah. So, um, we do. I think it's important for us to be able to offer free programs, but of course, to, for sustainability, um, we do have um, programs that cost money as well. And so, the way that it's set up is we have a free Makerspace family night every Thursday from 4.30 to 6. Um, that's weekly for kids and families of all ages. Um, 
And then we have a Friday free little learners time for two to five year olds and an adult with a structured activity and then free time in the center. And then Saturday and Sunday, we are now part of the Association of Science and Technology Centers, ASTC. And so um, the maximum for a family to come here is $15 for a visit. Um, however, we have an annual pass that's $85 for the year. It makes weekends free here. And then you can go to Arizona Science Center for free. You can go to Power, Powerhouse in Durango. You can go to Explore in Albuquerque. You can go, you can search by state and um, see all the free centers. So it's a very good deal. Um, and it's been fun to kind of see where the members go. And I, I think it's not only good for the Science Vortex um, for sustainability to be part of that, but also to give people in this rural area the opportunity to travel and see bigger centers. Um, it kind of plants the seed in people's minds when they travel. Cool. And of course, <laughs> there are t-shirts. We do right? have t-shirts. Don't forget t-shirts. <laughs> so uh, 3D printers back here. Yeah. sewing machines so there's all the pieces for maker spaces and yeah. we're going to go back there in a minute but there's all kinds of stuff yeah and we do a lot of so it's not just people coming to the center we opened in 2020 um so my original vision was to have people come exclusively here have field trips here have open hours here um but because 2020 was not the most hands-on year um we ended up doing a lot of outreach obviously we started virtually and then um we ended up really partnering with the libraries pretty early on and providing programming at the libraries or through the libraries and so that's continued and so we do a lot more outreach um me going to schools and doing programs um, than originally intended. But the reason I bring this up is because we do have a lot more stuff like robots and makey makeys and all that fun stuff um, that I don't necessarily put out in the center, but that we get out to the community. Cool. Can we take a, the tour? Yeah. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a clockwise tour. Um, so <laughs> choices. Play and exploration. And you wanna jump into the multi and make them feel a little dizzy yeah okay so um i before i opened the science vortex um i had lived in ashland oregon where there's a place called science works and um, with my own young children we became members there and that kind of um inspired me to open this place later i didn't know it at the time but um, it was right directly across from the middle school i was working at as an algebra teacher and so i would bring my kids there every weekend and um so some of the things here are inspired by there or other places we became astc members and we went to california we went to new mexico colorado um, around arizona and i just made massive lists of ideas that um we could maybe get in a center here um, for relatively low cost, because obviously um, some of the very big science centers, like we looked to get the pneumatic tubes um, exhibit and the cheapest that I could find was $16,000. So I quickly learned that those pre excuse me, fabricated um, stations are very expensive. So I built this with somebody in town. <laughs> and so come on in, Cal. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> How clever. Yeah. Under here. Climbing under. So this was something they had explored. I'm going to try to take as little space as possible. <laughs> <laughs> kids loved it. And so um, we got it in here for, you know, the cost of three mirrors and some wood. So um, this is one station where the kids can see that the mirror is gone forever and ever and ever. And what's happening with the image. So. Exploration starts at the door. <laughs> it's kind of cool, actually. I think so. <laughs> Mel, is your physics brain um, ha having some 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 somersaults here with this? You know me. I love a little bit of physics, and that's certainly some optics. So I'm in in my happy place. Oh, good. <laughs> and also, I grew up in Applegate near Ashland. I got my degree from Southern Oregon University, so I know that part of the world too. Oh, that's fantastic! I love Applegate Valley. Yep, spent some good time hiking there. <laughs> um, when we were designing stations, um, we thought having a selfie station is a very 
2020 thing to do. So <laughs> here's our selfie station with props. And um, one of the first things that we that I did was meet with a mayor. And um, now the mayor's kids come here all the time. And so we said, should we put hashtag Cottonwood Arizona? And he was all about it. <laughs> He's a good guy, though. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um, we have gears and these. Let's get to move them around and um, you can see pictures of gears. And then all of our science, um, this was inspired by ScienceWorks, um, has an explore. Um, where can you find gears? Um, just questions to make kids think. So we do have one field trip that is designed just for the school group children to go around and read the science and answer those questions. And NASA e things. This is my corner. Yes. <laughs> this is the dark sky corner. And um, so we do have dark sky parties. Um, we have averaged about lately about three a year, mm -hmm. um, two to three a year. And um, we don't always have them right here at the science vortex. In fact, we've only had one here. Um, but we plan them at local sites, usually libraries or schools. And um, we've had attendance anywhere from about, I don't know, 30 to over 100 people. Um, so we have information about dark skies and um, Cottonwood is a dark sky community, so. And there's a little cornhole toss on the planets, which is. But it is right? different point system. So it's one point if it lands on the board, two points if it lands on earth and three points if it lands in the sun, so. Sometimes we put out whiteboards with markers for people to keep track. <laughs> I'm going to try to get uh, get my cornhole beanbag in the sun. It sounds to me there like a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have a ball run um, magnetic board. That's always fun. What I like about this one is it's magnetic on both sides. So the kids can um, build around too. So they can create it so that it comes out. Yeah holes on the side so you can bring it around. And then you can build on the side, but it's also our tessellating side. Um, so we have some tessellating geckos. So I'm going to ask a quick question here because uh, your math background, um, yes. this to me seems like a really cool way to get kids interested in math, like because I just see an application board there. Is that yeah. how you use it? Absolutely. Yeah. And so um, usually I'll spark their interest with this. It's directly hands on right in front of us and then do an activity where they, you know, where you start with the, have you ever done the activity where you start with the index card and then you cut off the side and you have to translate it directly across. And so it involves measurement. And um, as long as it goes directly across, it'll keep tessellating. And so it's a good way to introduce kids to transformations and make it fun. I think that's fabulous. And just the fact that you have the word tessellations, I doubt a lot of kids are going to walk in and know what that means and have that's any idea as to how the mathematical concept is is related or translated, as you as you just said well. So really great way to think about it. So for teachers who are watching this, how might they create a tessellations board in their classroom that allows them to take math to that application level? Maybe they can see math more uh, succinctly. Yeah, there, there actually are tessellating puzzles that you can get that would be fun to use in the classroom, but also um, that activity that I was just saying, like have the kids make them. And then once they tessellate an object, they need to look at it and figure out what they see. So they're using creativity and then decorate what they see. So I've had like Among Us characters that kids have seen and gosh, so many things. I've seen dogs with weird eyes, <laughs> fish, you know, yeah. so and oftentimes they'll use something from pop culture that's popular. So a good way to, to do something hands-on before you get into the vocabulary. I love it. And I just, just very inspirational. Thank you for stopping there at the Tessellation Center. I'll talk math all day. <laughs> <laughs> so this area, I call it the purple wall area. It's our little learner's lab area and it's um, designed for five and younger. And so we have... Um, 
kind of the expected things of train tracks and Lincoln logs and Unif. I think they're called Unifix cubes, right? I should know that. Um, the little cubes you put together um, and a balance, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a lot packed in here. I try to keep it pretty organized, um, <laughs> but they can take things off the shelf. It's kind of set up. I My aim is for it to be Montessori-like. Um, of course, it's not all wooden, but... Um, Sometimes we switch out the things, we have a lot of games. Um, so the idea is that kids are working with their parents. And I have a, a student here, Lexi, who's been coming here since since 2020, really. She was one of the first people to come here. And Lexi, what, do you have a question for me? Yes. Yeah. What's your question? I think we all want another question. <laughs> Tell me. Can we walk we're, over there? We're going to we're going to walk and find out what Lexi wants. Yes, or okay. if you can just over here and you could show them the mural that's over here. You want to see what Lexi. Well, let's see, let's see what Lexi's asking about. <laughs> Cuz I'm not sure what she said. White stuff over here. This is let's the see. actual way we learn. We learn that's by right. watching oh, students yeah. questions and saying, "Okay, well what that might they ask in my classroom?" <laughs> He's looking at a pendulum that has um, ground glass as the sand. And she's wondering what we do with it. That we can just yeah, so you can rock it. Yeah, and the sand is a little bit low. It's fallen. I had students here earlier, so yeah. You get to touch it and play with it. I, I know that Danelle Hogan would love to join in and, and talk about that pendulum. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, so since we're back here, so um, over here, we have the pendulum um, on the <laughs> kind of hidden, but um, available when the kids want it. We have a keyboard. Um, and so the kids love that. We have microscopes and um, glass slides and plastic set slides. In fact, the glass slides um, that we have in here um, go with the TGen table that we have. So we have a genetics table that TGen um, made, which is a genetics company um, located in both the Valley area and in Flagstaff. And so it was TGen North and Flagstaff who we partner with um, quite a bit, actually. Actually, one of the so one of the folks that used to work with TGen is Julie Uber from Sarsef. Yeah, that's how I actually found out about TGen. Um, investigating valley fever game and so it's for kids to learn about genetic sequences and so the premise of the game is that three kids go on a field trip and they all um get valley fever and so we're trying to figure out where they they picked up Valley fever fungus. And so we have the genetic code of the microorganism and we're trying to match it, trying to match the amino acids to figure out if they got it at the dino dig, at the garden or at the dog friendly hiking trail. <laughs> yeah. And then you have little oh, microorganism then, puppets. Yeah. You've probably seen these at the um, museum stores at different museums, but this um, is E. coli. And so we set it up as a game that you match it with the card and then it has a very layman's description of what E. coli is. So E. coli is the bacteria that can be harmful and you need to cook beef to 160 degrees Fahrenheit to kill it. And so it's a matching game. <laughs> Your cool little plushies. And of course, you can guess which one the kids recognize right off <laughs> COVID. <laughs> of course. Right. But how cool, because, you know, that's giving our teachers a really great idea. I mean, it, with a couple of plushies and a matching game, I mean, just to get kids Absolutely. interested and curious and, you know, they can create their own kits per se, the way that you've done that there. That's, that's really, really creative. This is um, for teachers too, um, a fun one that kids like animal track and scat challenge. And so you don't even necessarily need the replicas. Um, you could just have a picture of it and have it be a matching game. 
And so we have a card um, that says porcupine, and then you have to find the porcupine. It has information about it. And so I do use the this um, station for field trips sometimes. So each of our field trips, just like other science centers, has a topic. And um, usually I set up the field trips to have different stations. Um, and then we talk about the stations and then end with um, free play and exploration. So. <laughs> so you get the the prince and the pook. Yep. So scat. And I even have a scat song. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> of course. We do. <laughs> Let's hear yeah. the scat song. Wait, you don't have to show me. That makes me nervous. <laughs> we'll, show the yeah, we'll look at scat while we're singing. Okay. We'll okay. be back. So scat, it makes the world go round. The forest can't survive if it's not on the ground. So when I step on a lump of scat. I jump for joy and tell myself that's where it's at. You're welcome. <laughs> Take that back bravo, to your class. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> that's where it's at. Ba -ba. I have my graduate degrees in environmental education, so that's not, that's I've got some cheesy songs in me. <laughs> a teacher in you, so, too. This is fantastic. <laughs> so we go from scat to rocks, and there's a so a mineral display. Yep, and all of these actually, um, a professor at ASU, um, Steve Semkin, donated these, and they're all local um, to the so to the Southwest, and it says what they are and where it's from. So, Steve yeah. is like the major geologist. He's amazing. He's an amazing guy. He's a member of Science Vortex too. Yeah. yeah. Um, the quartzite, granite, copper ore. Yeah. Copper ore. Here's copper, a little green. Now we sell it's copper with green. We keep the magnifying lenses there to inspire cool. exploration. Oh, my daughter's name is Micah, so I like this one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Micah for Micah. I like it. So, shall we go? Well, since we're over at the makerspace, why don't we do okay. perusal? Yeah. Okay, after you. So over here, um, we have a makerspace. It, it's more low budget over here in the sense of um, low tech. But again, we have more high tech that we break out now and then, um, which suits our rural setting because we don't have the staff or the budget to be able to be running um, dangerous machines and having them supervised. Um, so we have hot glue guns, glue sticks, rulers, tape, forks. Um, a lot of this stuff is donated by the community, um, which is awesome, but it's also um, quite a job going through donations um, that people think for makerspaces. We'll get a bunch of old, um, you know, drawers that were emptied out. And so we sort them, but we do appreciate those donations for sure. Um, and something that really is helpful from the community is the recycled materials like trays, plastic containers. Um, styrofoam pieces, toilet, um, paper rolls, wood. So we go through this quite a bit. Um, so you can see someone in action over here. Look at that pair, that's amazing. Can you tell us what you're making? Not sure. It snuck into the art room. Look at that creativity. <laughs> that's some great work there, how fun. Absolutely. And then we have um, a cabinet that is just filled with random stuff, stuff that either we find or is donated um, that people can decorate, like um, dishes and things like that. So um, that's in there. And then that's also where we keep a bunch of cardboard. And I'm very glad we have a cabinet for that. So if you're thinking about starting a makerspace, I highly recommend a cabinet or something you can close off because um, there's lots of other stuff you want to put somewhere, but it isn't necessarily organized. <laughs> that's a really good piece of advice. And that's such a large space. Do you find it challenging to organize um, or clean it up? Or do you have your students and your members? Are they pretty good stewards of organizing and, and cleaning things up as they go? Are pretty good. Um, just like in a classroom, you know, you set the expectation that that's what they need to do and uh, they're good with it. Um, I'm not saying that it's not a constant job <laughs> to organize the bins, but I think 
that's just part of the weekend workers' jobs is going through those fence. So it's not as, um, it's actually not as hard as it was when I was in a classroom to keep organized. All right. There you yeah. go. Shout out. Use the makerspace. I love it. So how about? And, and, and these things that they can incorporate when they're working on makerspace projects, but not take these things home. So we have a lot of little bits. Um, one benefit to working with the libraries is at, libraries are able to get grants pretty easily compared to um, just regular nonprofits, in my experience. Um, the Arizona Library um, Network, yeah, the system is um, has a lot of grant opportunities. So um, I've partnered with three, and um, this year I'm starting with a fourth library around here. Um, and sometimes when they get new things or run out of space, they end up giving me um, some of their old materials. And so I have a lot of little bits from the Sedona Library. I have a lot of snap circuits from the Cottonwood Library that they just um, weren't able to keep around for one reason or another. So I do. <laughs> do you want to keep showing? I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going while there's a bathroom break. So. In addition to these, there's the connects, various connects, and the some uh, connects, I don't know, direction sheets. There's some, um, this is kind of cool, shadow puzzles. Okay, this is one of the hardest ones. So there are only 18 total, and so they get progressively harder. So let's put an easier one. Yeah. Do you want to see one? Yeah. Look at these ones from the makerspace. Think about the perseverance. We're big on perseverance here. So um, if you haven't heard this before, teachers, um, we say to fail is first attempt in learning. And I want to have kids fail in the science vortex. It's okay. It is a good thing if you fail and then persevere and stick with it. So first attempt in learning, fail. <laughs> so you're pretending a building disappeared. This is the shadow. There's a flashlight here so you can test it. Kale, you want to try it? <laughs> I'm putting him on the spot. <laughs> Thanks. And so here are the blocks. So this is the shadow the shadow from the building from above. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You've got this now. Do I? I'll help you. Okay. So see how this is one unit? Mm -hmm. Now, uh-oh, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. So. So we're failing. Yeah, I think first attempt in learning. That's right. We're not giving up. Oh, you got that one. Got that one. Okay. And now, oh, oh. So far it looks like you got that way too. One of the easier ones. Cal, you're brilliant. See? <laughs> Congratulations, I can learn. I can, you're learn. <laughs> I can still learn. <laughs> I think that's yeah. very cool. Well, and you, did, you could do the first attempt in learning. So I like that. That's right. Good way. Oh, that's pretty neat. I like that. And then we have Ozobots. Um, we're here right now. Yeah. I got this puzzle for the Ozobots, which is cool, but then you can also draw. So they're robots that read color codes. I hope this one is charged. <laughs> we'll see. Uh oh, see, fail. First attempt in learning. Technology. And I have one plugged in over there. That's okay. That's a constant but, thing, but yeah. That's so. a, there's a color code kit or a key. And you can make your puzzle. Teachers, I love Ozobots for really all ages, um, but especially K through six, K through five. Um, with teaching kids, um, you can teach letters and then have the robot. They have to draw the letter. The robot has to follow it. Um, you can do geometry. And so different figures have the kids. Uh, it's a good way to test if they know what a pentagon is. Draw a pentagon and have the Ozobot follow the, the lines of the pentagon. How many sides does the pentagon have? Um, you can use angles, etc. cetera. So, um, and then you can get into really more in-depth um, projects of creating roller coasters with the dynamics of going slow uphill. So with problem solving and critical thinking, um, there's a lot there. You could really deep dive into Ozobots. 
Okay. Yes, you get to keep them. You get to take them home. <laughs> Um, x-ray table. Yep, we have an x-ray table and it has a full human body. It looks like somebody mixed the insects with the um, human body, but usually we have those separate. <laughs> you can build the body. And then next to it, um, I'm not sure this is charged right now. Um, we have an interactive poster. And when I was a sixth grade science teacher, I would have loved having this because um, the iPad has something on it where you interact with the poster. So it's augmented reality and um, they can learn about the different body systems. Cool. Yeah. And, the, and everybody loves a topo map. Yes. Interactive topo maps. Lexi, do you know how to make it rain? Ooh. Okay, ready? Ever go like this? Spread out your finger. Whoa. And now it's raining. So this is our watershed and where's the water flowing? That's so, so you can cool. see the water flow down to the low areas. Uh, I collect in lakes. So it looks like we have a few lakes right now. <laughs> That's so much fun. I love those. Yeah. How about um, this thing? Yeah, so this and um, the transmission, and we, we just had to get rid of um, seatbelts that we had because they have gotten used so many times that they broke. But um, the Rosenbluth Family Foundation is a um, huge supporting organization for the Science Vortex. And uh, we got connected with them through ACF, um, Arizona Community Foundation. And um, Gerald Rosenbluth was um, who the foundation was started for. And um, he created models like this for courtrooms for big automotive cases, um, big accidents. And so it says what it was from, and he would bring these into court. Um, so these are emergency windows. And the kids just think this is, that sometimes it's a space shuttle, sometimes it's, it's hands-on, it's fun. It's things that they don't usually get to do, like climb through windows. And they learn about levers and um, again, perseverance, because they're kind of hard to open. Um, the transmission, it's cool to actually see a transmission when you shift the car. So there is a shift, and you can imagine the younger kids love these. And so you can see the gears in the transmission. We'll do it again. So that's probably the best angle over there. Yes, but. Yeah. Cool. Lots of the dads who come in think that's really cool too. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And someday you're going to have an electric car in there um, or, you know, some sort of electric uh, transmission style. Like this is what we used to do and here's what we're doing now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And actually we have a pedal power. The boy over there is on it. Um, that is um, where you generate the power to light up the light bulbs. So oh, you just made me yeah, think of that. Yeah, how fun. Yeah. There you go. Battery power uh, at strength, strength and motion. Yep, let's go back that way. So um, this station is, of course, fun because you get to launch things. It's called the Winged Station. Um, and so we have different wings that were um, 3D printed and tails and Velcro. And so the kids uh, put it on. So we have a Science Vortex logo down there. There's actually a woman standing in the way, so I'm not going to do it right now. But um, you pump it up. Uh, Two, and then I'll launch it. And again, you have different style wings so you can compare. And then there's a poster about biomimicry. And here on this campus, we have an aviation program as part of um, a Cottonwood Oak Creek School District program um, that partners with Embry Riddle in Prescott. So um, just this week, we started to introduce the forces of flight. And so we always use this as part of that as well. You have a lot going on here. How about <laughs> the, the the wind tunnel? I love this. These I things are so cool. 
you know, I just, Cal, what I was just hearing was that partnership with Embry Riddle. That's also so great for kids to be able to see the connection to further study. Right. Well, look right. at that. They've been, they've been very, they've been very um, open to wanting to to do this work with you, right? They're with at Embry Riddle. We've gone on several field trips. Um, both with chief science officers, we have those as part of Science Vortex and with our aviation club. And um, then they, when we have events too, they've come and set up a booth. And so we have the SciTech Festival kickoff here at the Science Vortex, and we have over 20 organizations coming, and one of them is at the Riddle. And when is that? February 3rd, 2 to 4. Yeah. Yep. Here in Cottonwood. Yep. February 3rd, 2 to 4. So, yep. So more, Danelle, more physics. Yes. Well, throw some more of those in there. It's everywhere. This is fun for the littles, but um, with the older kids, um, sometimes like one idea for a field trip that we have here, one um, one of the field trips that we have is creating um, something that you test in the wind tube, and we have contests like whose will remain in there the longest. So just different contests. It's Hey, what is a variable? You guys like that one? <laughs> I like that one. Trying to trying to explain that to kids sometimes. Yeah. Challenging. Well, that's why they need to learn coding. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so so yeah, these things are so cool because you like make paper airplanes, you can do all kinds of like flying saucers and try and keep them from going out the top. Exactly. It's very fun. Love that. Everybody likes a good wind tunnel. Showed you most of the organized area. There's the behind the scenes crazy storage area <laughs> that we use for field trips and stuff. But and we summer camps is a big thing here too. So so what uh what kind of summer camps are you doing? Whatever comes to us. Um we now have the full month of June in partnership with this school district. And I, I don't want you to think that we only work with the school district. We work with all school districts in this area. Um, it's just that we have a very strong relationship just being here with the school district. And of course, it's the closest one. Um, so they have the 21st Century Grant, um, which offers summer learning money. And so this will be our fourth summer. Uh, I actually have a meeting. Um, Monday next week to plan summer camp for this year with them. So June we've given to them and that's that really helps us uh, because we have 30 campers every day, Monday through Friday, nine to three. Um, so that keeps us afloat for um, financially for a good portion of the year. And then um, the month of July is public camps. So we have usually week long summer camps um, and again, it kind of, the topics kind of vary um, year to year, depending on the opportunities. We really try to partner. I guess if you're thinking about doing something like this in your own community, partnerships is where it's at. <laughs> Can I plug the Arizona Science Center? Because absolutely, we, we did provide one of a couple of the camp absolutely. weeks, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, what we did last year that with Arizona Science Center is um, we had two day or three day um, summer camps for the younger kids. And that worked well and it was my first time trying. So yes, um, Arizona Science Center has been super, super supportive of the science vortex, um, whether it be bringing up big planetariums for um, on days where we have dark sky, um, putting us in touch with astronomers, et cetera. So we also have robots that we've um, borrowed from them, the Edison robots with a big map of Mars. Um, so yeah, lots of good things with partnerships. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Does anybody, so we've walked around pretty much. Um, Did you want to sit down? Yeah. Does anybody have questions for Lori? I am monitoring the chat, but I'll start, I'll start with a question about, uh, you were just talking about summer camps. So what grade levels? I, I don't know if you said it specific. I heard littles, but. Um, um, so the center is designed for two to 12 year olds. And okay. uh, we do offer field trips up to eighth graders, um, mostly seventh and eighth graders that's working through field trips. Um, we just did a sheet part dissection last week with seventh and eighth graders from a local school. Um, 
the summer camps are mostly K through sixth grade, that age range. I think I heard you say nine to three. So they're day camps. You don't do any overnight camps, anything like that, right? No. Yeah. Wouldn't want to put that on your on your shoulders for sure. That's <laughs> one of my, my, I hear you there. Um, who else has a question? Does anybody else have a question or comment? Yes, I do, I do. Ooh. I'm just curious, what is your favorite uh, part of the museum there? So, Ooh, what's my favorite part of the museum? The topo map, that's everyone, you know, it's just got the ooh and awe ah to it. But I would say um, my favorites change based on kind of what comes to me. You know, um, I didn't know about 3D printing. I mean, I knew about it, but I didn't know how to 3D print before I opened the Science Vortex. And um, just making connections at different trainings or summits and um, yesterday we had somebody from ASU that I met at the Rural STEM Summit up in Flagstaff. Um, he works at ASU and runs um, his own business where he's getting, uh, creating Python coding learning that's all offline so that um, in remote areas around the country, but specifically he's focusing on Arizona right now, they can still learn how to code. And so we had a two and a half day workshop and uh, my favorite part of the center was that corner yesterday because we designed a course and the kids had to program the robot using Python. They had to take a picture of, um, I believe it's called, um, oh, what is it? The pigeons don't ride the bus. It's a popular kids book. You might know it out there, but anyway, we read that story and uh, then they had to take a picture of the pigeon because the pigeon was trying to get on the bus. <laughs> and what are you dreaming about that you want to have there that you don't have yet? Wow. I mean, Arizona Science Center recently uh, sent up their um, travel Guinness World Records exhibit. And that was really exciting. I mean, it would be so cool to have um, that happen on a regular basis um, where we have those, that high cost exhibits here. Um, that would be my dream. But I kind of like that it's, that it wouldn't be here for more than a month because then it's always something new. So like yeah, just space. my dream is to continue that partnership, Cal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, of course. I think that'll happen. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, I feel like it's less about things. I just hope that um, everyone continues to work together because really that's the way that this place has stayed um, open is partnerships. Anything else? Thank, thank you so much. This has just been amazing. Um, I did have another couple of questions. The programs you say that you bring to, you say you go out, you have outreach and you bring programs to schools. What yep. kinds of programs similar to what you have there? What kind of programs do you bring to schools? Yeah, well, again, it's, it's exciting. Uh, sometimes it feels a little unnerving because you never know what the next year is going to hold, <laughs> but it really is about what the community wants and what grant opportunities there are. And that kind of creates our programming. Um, so it's kind of a reaction to those two um, needs slash wants. Um, we are, well, let me give you an example from last year. Um, at one of the local schools, they said, hey, we have grant money um, to for kids to use food and learn the science of food in creative ways, but um, to really have it be STEM. So we came up with an eight class series and I went into um, four different grades and did eight different lessons in each grade. And so that was really, really fun. Um, and then this spring, um, their after school, there's an after school program reached out and asked if I could do STEM. So um, I just proposed the lessons and that's the type of thing that I would do here with camps or with field trips, um, but I'm bringing that to them. So again, it just, it really depends. Um, we, uh, through Kale, we um, learned about the 
Mars Math and the Edison Robots. And so um, we've since written that into a grant and now we're gonna be doing, um, we have, I believe it's a four class kind of workshop with kids at a local school. It's an elementary school um, where we're gonna be learning the Edison Robots and then programming them with the map of Mars. Oh, that's so cool. If I'm a teacher in the Verde Valley, uh, I could come to the Science Vortex and say, gosh, I really wanna do um, this project but it would require, I don't know, uh, maybe one field trip at, at, at the Science Vortex, and then could you come to my classroom? Is that a possibility? It is. There, I'm not going to say it's free. Um, it, there is a cost, um, but sometimes we can find that funding. Um, and the schools have field trip funds as well. So um, we try to keep it very fair. And um, yes, if you can't make it to us, we will go to you for sure. And um, we've worked with a lot of school districts in the area, Sedona, Camp Verde, um, Beaver Creek, Cottonwood, um, Jerome, Clarkdale, Jerome, um, and then we've even extended into areas of Prescott as well. So um, my hope is that over time, we'll get more people from Prescott and Flagstaff too. And the libraries. The libraries have been a really big component of this too, haven't they? Absolutely. Yeah, the libraries have been a huge part. I feel like we really have a pretty strong STEM network right now in the Verde Valley. Um, and you can see that with our month-long festival of STEM. So how many events are going to be in February? This year we have 65. Last year we had 42 and 1,304 participants. So with 65, we're going to have even more and I'm excited about it. <laughs> That's fantastic. 65, wow. just right there in the Verde Valley area. Yep. Yep. Wow. Congratulations. There, thank you. And um, I'm excited because the topics really vary. I mean, there's there's archaeology, there's there are robots, there's 3D printing, there's the, the, the arts. It's going to be cool. <laughs> so there's something for everybody to do in the Verde Valley on, in Feb, well, all the time, but definitely STEM in February. And I'll make sure to get that uh, those websites into the show notes so people can see that calendar and book and make their plans, book plans to go and visit you in the science vortex. One piece of advice for teachers out there. Um, the, the STEM organizations want to work with you and they have so many resources. And I, I give myself this um, advice too. Like I just met with somebody from Bisbee Science Lab and um, we were just swapping ideas, swapping lessons, just like you do as a teacher, the um, STEM organizations want to work with you and do that. So don't be afraid to reach out. That's great advice. Yeah. Super advice. We have one more comment in the chat and this is from Beth uh, Nickel. You've done a fantastic, an amazing job with Science Vortex. It's such an asset to the Verde Valley. So Lori, kudos to you from your science center guru, the guru of the Arizona Science Center. I was gonna um, say, I wouldn't be able to do it without just Beth. Partner. So thank you, Beth. Just partners. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to say it, Beth. I was like, well, I can't let that go unseen because I know Cal's got the phone, so Lori couldn't see uh, your <laughs> awesome comment. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I thank everyone for being here today. Uh, Cal and Lori, wow, thank you so much for hosting. Um, Cal, all the videography, et cetera. Lori, thank you for hosting us as your guests in the in the science vortex there at the Verde Valley. I cannot wait to get up there myself. We are looking forward to doing more um, events like this. This is our STEM leadership coaching cadre showcase series. And We'll look forward to seeing you all again in March, I believe, is our next one. So we'll make sure to get that on canyonpd.com. We are so fortunate at um, Canyon Professional Development to be able to bring these to all of you. And um, and just this this is the team. It's not a one person thing. It's it's everybody on this call to make this happen. So thanks to those of you who are, who are joining us now and online. And thanks so much, Cal and Lori. We'll see you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for showcasing the Science Vortex.